like to call the meeting to order. Welcome to the 214th annual town meeting. If you are a Morristown resident that is not registered to vote, see a poll worker to my right to register. David Polo will not be in attendance today to preside as moderator. I, Bob Beeman, as chair of the select board, will facilitate town meeting until a moderator is elected later this morning. Seated to my left are fellow select board members, Eric Dodge, Judy Bickford, Brian Kellogg, and Christopher Town. Seated to my right are town clerk, Sarah Haskins, and two People's Academy students, Cameron Chertoff and Madeline Moffitt. They're back here. Cameron was born in Bronx, New York, and moved to Vermont two years ago. He is a sophomore at People's Academy, and he is planning to attend college for musical theater. Madeline was born in Lodi, California. This is her first year living in Vermont after previously living in Tampa, Florida. She is a junior at People's Academy, and she is planning to study political science in college. Cameron and Madeline will now lead us in the flag salute and national anthem. Please rise for the flag salute presented by members of Boy Scout Troop 876 of Morrisville. There are no objections. Local legislative representative Avram Pat, David Yacovoni, and State Senator Rich Westman are present and want to speak briefly about legislative issues. Good morning. I'm Dave Yacovoni. Good to see you all here. I'm going to try to be as brief as I can. There are, there are many issues before the legislature, but from where I sit, we're a state in transition. Many of our small schools are at peril. Some of our small hospitals are facing extreme financial pressures. Several of our small nursing homes have had to receive extraordinary financial relief. Small schools, our uh, small stores in our communities are closing. It's a pattern developing here, and it's really about how do we protect and strengthen the rural Vermont that I think many of us feel so strongly about. From where I sit on the Appropriations Committee, I'm giving a very hard look and perhaps might try to redirect some of the budget I'm not a fan of giving people five or $10,000 to come to Vermont. I'd rather take that money and invest it in Vermont 
to try to strengthen our communities and those who are already here. There are a lot of issues. I won't go into all of them by, by any means, but I do want to let you know I, I uh, have a poll on the table over here with my uh, annual t town report. Would love it if you'd take the time to fill it out. It just allows me to get a sense of what people are thinking. Thank you. Good morning, I'm uh, Avram Pat, and serving in the House of Representatives al along with Dave. And I also have my uh, written report over on the table, uh, which was also available uh, online through Front Porch Forum and on my website. But if you haven't seen it, please take a copy. Uh, this term, I am serving on the Energy and Technology Committee. Uh, it was very different than in my previous term two sessions ago when I was on the health care committee. So I've, I've gotten uh, a, 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 a very broad uh, sense of, of work in, in our committees. Uh, the committee I'm on now is dealing, first of all, with energy issues, uh, uh, regulated and unregulated uh, energy, climate change legislation, uh, and I expect that we will put out some, some legislation, some bills, uh, in the next few weeks before the session, uh, this session ends. Most of our work so far has been about uh, broadband, which as everybody knows is a very big issue uh, in this area as well as in the rest of the state and in particular the rural parts of the state. Um, that bill uh, was voted out of our committee uh, unanimously last week. Uh, it still has a long way to go, but it, it, it does a bunch of things to try to promote getting uh, higher speed broadband out really to the last mile uh, in the rural areas, the underserved and unserved areas. Uh, that's a lot of the work that I've been doing. I know personally at uh, our home in Worcester, uh, our uh, service is, is certainly substandard like it is for many other people uh, in this area. Uh, so a combination of incentives, uh, financing options, and support for uh, communities, a number of towns in different parts of the state have formed communication union districts uh, to work together with sometimes uh, partners in the private sector uh, to, get, uh, to get broadband out. So that's a, a large part of my focus. Thank you. So um, I'm Rich Westman, and um, I would follow up what Dave said, that what we're seeing a lot of pressure on small hospitals, um, local um, health care providers, and that's part of the reason, particularly in the health care area, and that, that um, I moved from transportation last year to health and welfare um, as my morning committee in the Senate. I'm a, um, I'm on the finance committee and on the board at Copley, and I firsthand see the pressure that the um, budget for the hospital is under. And these small community hospitals, um, our schools in um, communities like this, I also entered two bills this year um, to create a moratorium to um, let districts like Morristown and Stowe have more time to figure out um, what they need to do and where, um, where we're going um, in um, this time. But it is about the fabric of small town Vermont and where we are. And we really need to be careful in the way we think about all of that. So I completely agree with Dave around that. Um, besides that, part of the reason um, that I wanted to be on um, um, health and welfare was there are a lot of issues around young families and the difficulty of it for them to stay there, and child care is a big piece of that, and I've done a lot of work on child care. In the Senate, we're on two committees, and my afternoon committee is um, appropriations, and most of my focus, because they break the committee up into sections and give us certain areas to work on and make recommendations to our other members, most of my um, uh, work there has been in um, the human services area with DCF, with Dale, and working on issues like that. So um, I think at this point um, we could answer questions. 
um, and if you wouldn't mind for a couple minutes. Actually, I have a question for you. I'm not sure which one wants to answer it, but I get asked uh, quite frequently about um, the condition of our roads and our bridges, and um, you know, we're, we're trying to put together a plan to rebuild our roads in the town, but I hear lots of comments on social media and calls at home about how bad the roads are and the potholes that never seem to go away and roads we just did that are already bad again. And um, can you make a comment about uh, what, what the state has for a plan or if it does have a plan to rebuild them? Well, um, as you know, um, there is a plan on Route 100 and they've been working north. Route 15, they start this year um, and there is a four-year plan to repave everything from Essex um, um, clear to the um, to Wilkett. Um, you know, as I travel Route 15 every day, um, you know, and travel it this morning, um, there's a lot of work to do on that, and I'm not sure the plan is quick enough, but it all is in the plan over the next four years to do stuff. The question is, how quick will you do it? I would say underlying, though, in the transportation budget, you're beginning to see the transportation system um, move. You're beginning to see it move from um, uh, uh, revenue sources that were based around gasoline taxes. And as we drive more efficient vehicles, as we get electric vehicles, um, it is becoming harder and harder to support um, the infrastructure that we've got. You know, for example, electric vehicles, they pay nothing um, to use the road. And you can't have um, no money coming in and, and do infrastructure work. So we are in that transition time of trying to figure out how we maintain the infrastructure and the important infrastructure we've got as we see revenue sources drying up. And um, so the, you know, people are beginning to work hard on that issue but that is the underlying issue that has put, is putting us behind the eight ball. Thanks, Rich. I'm curious to know, because you guys have an inside view of what's going on, if you think that the federal government should be doing more for states in general, and also particularly more for poorer uh, communities, uh, rural and or not. Um, uh, do you think they have more responsibility to helping those communities out, I guess, uh, in the big eye on the pie? Um, and, and or do you have a way to address it if they don't meet those responsibilities? Is it expected to fall on everyone's back here who lives just in these communities? Thank you uh, for the question. Uh, I, I think the weather report from the federal government is quite mixed. Um, uh, many initiatives that were started, for instance, our rural health clinics, what we call our federally qualified health care clinics, um, our uh, special payment provisions for small hospitals. All of those things are home health agencies that are in Vermont facing over a million dollar reduction. Uh, many of those investments are, um, if not plateauing, going the, going the other direction. And I think there's a, it's a burden that shifted to the states, and each state has a vastly different capacity to make up for that, to uh, uh, fill any of those kinds of holes. I know we don't. Um, so as to what to do about it, I, I think we're one small state. We get three congressional people. It's, it's really aligning with other rural states and trying to come up with small state minimums and, and other things that we can do. But a lot of it is, frankly, I think beyond our control. I'm not a pessimist, and I don't mean to be uh, sound depressing, et cetera. Um, I think resiliency starts at home, and there's a lot that we can do to be independent. We haven't had a lot of lead time on it but we'll do what we need to do to take care of Vermont best we can. 
I just want to add uh, a, a lot of what uh, we have to do at the State House these days is try to figure out when, when the federal government steps back uh, from things it has been doing, let's either with funding or in environmental regulation or or a whole bunch of other areas. Uh, it's our we have to figure out whether or not. Uh, Vermont can do any, anything about that, and if so, how much? And and sometimes uh, we we can't do anything, or we can't do we can't we can't replace what uh, all of what the federal government has stepped away from. Another area I wanted to mention because uh, I've heard actually from uh, several people in our district just in the last few days is the changes in uh, as people are doing their taxes, the changes uh, that have happened at the federal level in terms of income tax, which are causing um, uh, e either uh, lower refunds or basically higher taxes for an awful lot of uh, middle income uh, people. And I know in the past session, Vermont took some steps uh, to try to mitigate some of that, but again, that's not something we can uh, fix in Vermont. There are places where we might be able to uh, take a step here or there to make that uh, a little less painful for people, but that, that's the issue we're dealing with these days. I just say that um, I think there's a crisis in rural America, and I think that crisis in rural America is both nationally and um, here at the state level. If you look at much of the, um, a lot of the middle of the country in rural, unemployment rates are high, um, and people aren't doing well in those rural communities and people aren't moving there. But also here in Vermont, if you look at our population here, our population is stagnant across much of the state, except for Lamoille, Franklin, and Chittenden counties. We're seeing population growth that nobody else is seeing. The four southern counties in the state are losing population now. And one of the places that I think that plays out, and part of my concern about our own hospital here is, if you go to communities like Springfield, their hospital is um, in terrible shape and on the verge of collapsing. And uh, we're, we've, we, in the budget adjustment, just adjusted Medicaid rates to address that. You know, when you look at things like broadband, in the 1930s, we made a commitment to people through um, um, rural electrification, that we were going to have power to everybody, regardless of where you lived. And we've dumped a bunch of state money and a bunch of federal money into Wi-Fi and broadband, but we haven't made the commitment that we we're going to get it to everybody in, out even in rural communities. And it is affecting the economy of those places. So. I think both at the state level and at the federal level, we're falling down in um, our response to rural America. Everett Fryman, in Morrisville, Vermont. Uh, I'd like to begin by offering my family's most sincerest condolences to the senator on the passing of your late father. Again, you have my condolences, sir. To the representatives present, I would like only to urge them to both very much consider the bill under consideration right now that is going to stop fossil fuel infrastructure in the state, the further development and maintenance of fossil fuel construction in this state. And I, as a commuter that commutes to Stowe, as my spouse who commutes to Burlington five days a week, and that we have fossil fuel vehicles currently, that's a, no, a non-starter for us. We sincerely hope that when this comes to a vote in the House of Representatives, that you sincerely consider our need as well as the needs of many in this auditorium and of course in the greater community of Morristown that we still depend on fossil fuels to get not only from our place of residence to our place of business, but also to things like the physician, the market, to other appointments, to the State House so that we can confer with you individuals down there. It's all very, very important. And unfortunately, as we have previously discussed with my representatives present, that we still need that bridge from the carbon energy of today to the carbon-less energy of the future. We still need that bridge, and we don't have it yet. 
And while electric vehicles are a wonderful thing, to an extent, provided they are not sourced with child labor, as I have previously stated, point being <clears throat> is that we don't have that technology, nor do we have the affordability yet for the majority of Vermonters. So again, I sincerely urge my representatives to consider this when this comes to a vote in the State House. Thank you. Thank you. So before he goes totally away and, and says, I do want to tell you that um, he referred to my dad passing in December, and my dad did. And he was at home. Couldn't have happened without Memorial Home Health. And um, my partner, Joan, is um, on the board at Lamoil Home Health right now. If it wasn't my dad, his last 10 years, he farmed too long. He had a lot of health issues. My dad wouldn't have been, had a, a good last 10 years without Copley Hospital, without the Manor Nursing Home, and without uh, Lamoil Home Health. And we live in a pretty special place, and we have some great services here. And it makes this place better. Good morning, my name is Ed Wilson and I'm a resident of Morristown. I have some comments and questions for our legislators. I'll apologize in advance that uh, if this seems somewhat disjointed, it was written out fully and made uh, complete sense to me, but it's way too long. <laughs> our country and culture considers the rights of individuals to be paramount. All of our founding documents celebrate and are based on the principles of individual human rights. As a strong believer in all of those rights, I was dismayed to read in H58, House Bill 57, a bill about abortion, as introduced, a bill that is currently in the Vermont House, and I came to the statement written by our legislators that says, quote, a fertilized egg, embryo, or fetus shall not have independent rights under Vermont law. I'm appalled that our legislature would deem any group to have no independent rights. That statement was in the first version of the bill that David and Abram sponsored and voted for. I was pleased to see that it was not in later versions of the bill until I checked with legal experts who told me that removing it had no effect on the bill. H57 must be closely read for what it does not say as well as for what it does say. On page 3, line 16 of this first version, the phrase, give birth to a child, appears reaffirming the right of an individual to choose to carry a pregnancy to term. Except for that mention of a child, there's no other reference to any kind of human, only to individuals. There's no mention of human, woman, female, girl, or minor female. The only two indications that this is about humans is that, a single men is that single mention of child. The second indicator that this is about humans is because PETA, people for the ethical treatment of animals, have not been staging daily demonstrations at the State House because people for the ethical treatment of animals would never allow a bill like this to be written about animals. David, the purpose of my comments are not to start a general discussion about abortion. These comments are narrowly focused on the rights of viable unborn children at 28 weeks and beyond. I note that the UVM Medical Center Neonatal Intensive Care Unit offers full resuscitation for neonates born at 23 weeks and beyond, and in some cases, even before 23 weeks. David wrote a From the House article for the News and Citizen, which appeared in the February 21st edition and also on Front Porch Forum. He relates the story of befriending a man at the State House who was clearly uncomfortable about being there. All of the things in that story are 
clearly in character for the David that I know. And the following is a quote from the article. The man went on to say how disgusted he was that we would allow babies in the ninth month of pregnancy to be murdered. I mustered all the gentleness and kindness I could give, I could given his fragile state, and tried to set him straight. I said, please understand that federal law since 2003 prohibits late-term abortions. If the life of the mother is at risk, they can be done. But in Vermont, an ethics committee reviews any such request, which happens rarely. The article states he did not believe me or just could not accept what I was saying, I think because his views were so ingrained within him. I was grateful that I could at least try to educate him about late-term abortions and clear up the misinformation he had heard. It's the end of the quote. The, you should read the article. It's a very nice article. I was curious, so I emailed Dave, complimented on him on the story, and asked him about the law that prohibits late-term abortions and about the lack of parental consent for the abortion uh, concerning a minor child. Dave emailed back that the language relating to late-term abortions is in the intent section of the bill with the words, or contravene 18 U.S. Code, Section 1531. He also told me that he had voted against requiring parental consent for a minor because in his years of work, he has seen many cases of incest in Vermont and a parental consent uh, requirement would drive minors underground for abortions and put them at great risk. That satisfied me until I saw something else about uh, late-term abortions. I looked up section 1531 and found that it only applies to partial birth abortions. There's nothing else in 1531 about late term abortions or anything in age 57 that would prohibit or restrict an abortion right up until the moment of birth for any reason or for no reason. I'm ashamed to say I didn't know this, that a, uh, an abortion could take place so late in a pregnancy. H57 specifically prohibits any public entity from stopping an abortion. There's no requirement that an abortion has to take a place in a hospital, that an ethics committee be involved. And the way the bill is written, it looks like any ethics committee or anyone else who tried to impede or stop that abortion could be charged with a crime. Again, read age 57 for what is not in it. When I tell people that there's no restrictions on late-term abortion, they usually look at me skeptically because they don't really believe that that can be true. After a moment of reflection and the beginning of a painful acceptance of what I've told them, they will say something like, but it probably doesn't happen very often. At this point, I asked them how many times it is okay that a full-time viable baby gets aborted. The legislat legislators are not this, in this alone. They are our representatives. We're responsible for what they do, for what we let them do. David, I'd like to know if you have any other information to provide us that there really are any prohibitions or even restrictions on late-term abortions. If you don't have any and learn today that 1531 does not cover late-term abortions, will you change your mind about or try to amend H57? In the absence of other information, will you write a column to explain that the gentleman you befriended at the State House was correct and that you gave him and the readers of the News and Citizen and Front Porch information incorrect or at least incomplete information? For both David and Abram, can you give us a plan to stop the cycle of abuse of minor females at the hands of relatives? Or with no reporting requirement, it looks like the minor child could have an abortion and be sent right back to the family to consider the cycle of abuse. 
And will you please explain your reasoning for voting for legislation that specifically designates any group of humans as having no rights? Thank you. Ed, thank you. I think this is what the spirit and really the value of a town meeting is, where you can have these conversations. I'm mindful the clock is ticking. I'm going to try to be very uh, succinct. You put a lot on the table. I don't know if I can answer it all. But, but to be clear, the legislation we voted on puts uh, into attempts to put into Vermont law what has been happening for the last 46 years. It's the same law that's been in place since Roe v. Wade since 1973. It's no different. I stand behind that law, and I also stand behind my article. Uh, I would never intentionally, though I, I know you didn't say that, uh, mislead anyone. From the testimony we took and the people that I listened to at the medical center, it was the only place where any of these kinds of abortions would happen, and they haven't. They haven't happened in Vermont. There's no requirement, David. Uh, I understand, other than the federal limitations since 2003. That it take place in a hospital. The bill specifically states that yes, any certified I, uh, licensed practitioner. It, it does, but the Medical Society, which supports this bill, it's very clear a physician is not going to be doing a late-term abortion, which is only done if in the case of the mother's uh, life and safety, or, the, or that it's clear that the viability of the fetus is not possible, is only going to be done in a medical setting, and they're not done in Vermont. As to the um, parental notification, I, I remember in the 90s when I was in the legislature voting the same way. Um, uh, sadly, we are not in a life of Ozzie and Harriet, some of you remember that, or fathers knows best anymore, where we, where we know that families are connected and they'll get the support they need during a challenging period like this. There are many who, if being told you can go to a judge and make your case, when sadly it was the father or the brother or the uncle or a cousin who was the father, they're not going to do that. It will drive them underground. So we all, we all have our own feelings and beliefs on this, and they're deeply held, and I deeply respect that. In my mind, the bill that's now in the Senate um, provides the same protections that we've had for the last 46 years. I think they're worth protecting. Uh, I'll just say uh, briefly, I, I, I think uh, Dave made uh, most of the points that I would have made, which is, which is that um, th what this bill uh, does is um, uh, put into writing in Vermont statute what in fact has been um, our law. In terms of um, restricting procedures that have to take place in a hospital, there are uh, clinics and medical facilities all across the state that perform uh, surgical procedures that are, that are not in hospitals. Um, the state generally does not get into regulating that's what procedures must be done in a hospital or, 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 or anything like that. I myself um, uh, get uh, uh, surgical uh, treatments unrelated to this, to this matter regularly. Um, at a facility that is that is not a hospital, and so we, just as a as a general practice in terms of what Vermont regulates and does not regulate in terms of healthcare, uh, we do not regulate uh, the location. We regulate um, who is qualified to do what kinds of uh, medical procedures. I also asked for. Uh, an explanation of the reasoning for voting for legislation that specifically designates any group of humans as having no rights. And I'm going to sit down and thank you very much for your answers and consideration. Well, please answer that question. 
So um, the Bill H-57 has come to the Senate. Um, it's in um, the Health and Welfare Committee where I sit. Um, I'm not sure what we're going to do with the bill. Um, we may take a completely different tact within um, uh, in the Senate. Um, we have um, the ability that they don't have in the House to initiate constitutional amendments. We have a constitutional amendment that talks about reproductive rights in our, um, in our committee. We took a hearing on that last week, and um, instead of taking up all the time here, um, my article um, that will be in um, the News and Citizen and Snow Reporter, and I'll post on Front Porch Forum, um, will be out this week. And, um, but the difference between a constitutional amendment and that is that ultimately the decision would be a vote of the public. Um, the last question that Ed posed, the um, Vermont Supreme Court in 1988 made a ruling that a fetus does not have rights. I um, stood with that. Uh, decision based on the testimony that I heard. So, good morning, Amy. Oh. No. And I'm done. The Supreme Court also said that there was no reason that the Vermont legislature could not give the fetus rights. Hi again. <laughs> it's okay. Amy Town, Morrisville, Morristown, Morrisville, Morristown, Morrisville, Morristown, Morrisville. Zero five six six one. All right. Happy Town Meeting Day. Happy Mardi Gras. Let's say la Boon Town Brule. So, on a much lighter note. Well, not really. First, my plug. DCF. There are children in custody at astronomical rates. If you're concerned about children, babies, all that good stuff. Please consider being a foster parent or adopting a child in need. Seems like people are really interested in helping kids, so that's my plug. Affordability, that's the deep topic. For two budget addresses, our governor has um, stressed affordability in Vermont and has made attempts to recruit, bring new people in, expand the tax base from other states which is great, except we can't afford to live here. So I just implore you as our legislators, because you guys do a good job anyway, but to keep in mind as these things are rolling down the pike, affordability is a big issue. We are at the 50th state out of 50 in funding our state colleges. That's not a good statistic. It should not be less expensive for me to send my kids to a private school in New Orleans rather than sending them to Johnson State down the street and around the corner. Wait, NVU, right? So please, please fund our state colleges. Anyway, paid family leave and affordable high quality childcare. These things would help our Vermonters. We wanna be here, we're working hard to be here. Please keep us in mind. Thank you, Amy. Hi, Chris Ranson, soon to be at Morrisville again. Um, a couple of things on the highway situation. You speak about putting them back together again. I noticed most, a lot of the brakes are lineal, parallel with the center line, from overloaded trucks. And, you know, in 40 years, I've seen portable scales out on the highways twice. And I've never seen the um, scale on the interstate open. You know, when you can do whatever you want, people tend to do that. And I think we're paying the price, and I don't think we can afford to let it run free like it's been running. And on the um, connectivity with the internet and all, after the last little debacle with the feds in, in Wall Street, $175 million got dumped into our um, structure there. There's been no accountancy. You know, and historically, if you have old, out-of-date, bad computers, 
or don't know what you're really doing and write code, Vermont is the place to go. And we really do need to account on that. Or else we'll just be, you know, wasting some money. We've already developed a minor problem with town clerks here and then putting their hand in the till. That's chump change compared to what's out there. And with nobody accounting, it's a free shot. Thank you. Jane Campbell, Morrisville. Um, I just want to add the gentleman who was talking about the fossil fuel legislation that's out there. Um, I would encourage you to keep the parts of that legislation that help low-income Vermonters or and rural people living in rural areas so that the, the funds that get taken in go to those folks. So thank you. Are there any other questions for our legislator? Hi, I'm Melissa Jordan of Morrisville, and I've already spoken with Dave, um, but I just wanted to say I'm aware that there is legislation to protect the pollinators, um, which is huge for our survival as a species, and I'm really anxious to see the results of that. Also, I know that um, there is something happening with plastic bag banning, and I'm really excited to hear about that as well. And I just wanted to encourage you all um, to keep focused on the prize of our um, ecology and our survival as a species. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, gentlemen. Thank you all. It's a privilege to represent you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. To start off me and Madeline's announcements, I just wanted to give a description, not a description, uh, uh, explanation for why I decided to do the town meeting. Uh, one of them is I believe that the school having such a positive connection with the town is really essential just for like growth and keeping a good cycle in the town. And I also believe that Public speaking is also just a great thing to do and partake in because it is uh, an essential skill that we always will need as humans. And I just also 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 <laughs> wanted to thank Sarah Haskins and the rest of the people that put me and Madeline and helped us do the town meeting. And I just want to say thank you to them. Uh, uh, now me and Madeline will go over some brief general announcements. The annual town report is the historical report or historical record of the town. Inside it, you will find department reports as well as reports from many community organizations. If you do not have a town report, you may pick one up at the front table or raise your hand at this time, and a Boy Scout will be glad to deliver it to you. The select board proudly dedicates the 2018 town report to Carol Bradley for her years of dedication, hard work, and devotion to our community. Carol retired as finance director in February of 2018 after 37 years of service to the town of Morristown. The select board extends their thanks and appreciation to Carol for her dedication and assistance in making Morristown a great community. Please see her full dedication on the first page of the town report. This meeting is being recorded and anyone wishing to speak must come forward to the middle aisle like we've seen before and state his or her full name before addressing the assembly. And if you cannot get into the center aisle, we will be glad to provide a portable microphone. We would like to remind you that there is no smoking in the school buildings or on school grounds. And also that cell phones uh, should be turned off except for emergency response personnel. People's Academy National Honor Society students Darian Duby and Lexi Dambach will be providing childcare in the middle level learning center. Snacks will be provided. The, Morris, uh, the Morrisville Soccer Club Euro trip is providing concessions this morning over there. The donations will benefit the girls' uh, soccer trip to Barcelona in July and there'll be no luncheon today. Several groups and organizations are sponsoring tables here in the gym. Stop by, talk to the representatives, and see their displays. 
Oh, I just, me, we all gotta, yeah. we want to give a big thanks to the entertainers for the opening music. Allen Church has been performing at our town meetings for over 10 years, and we want to thank the PA Middle Level Chorus for their particip participation as well. On behalf of the town of Morristown, we want to thank the staff of People's Academy for their cooperation and great job they do every year setting up for the annual meeting, especially Peter Gian for the sound system. <laughs> Similar to Cameron, I would like to say thank you to Sarah Haskins, Phil Grant, and everyone else who helped put a part into this organization of the town meeting. Growing up in a large state such as Florida, the opportunity to co-host a town meeting was not available to people, especially of my age range. I think it is incredibly valuable to put the youth of the community involved in the processes of decision making of any community, state, or even at the federal level. Along with Cameron, I believe forming a relationship between the school and the rest of Morristown by having students host the town meeting is highly beneficial for all parties. I would like to say thank you again for the amazing opportunity. The annual meeting of the Town of Morristown, Vermont for March 5th, 2019 is declared open at 9.46 a.m. The Town Administrator Dan Lindley and Finance Director Tina Sweet are seated in the front row. Neither one is a Morristown resident. If there is no objection, they will speak if necessary. The town's warning is published on pages six through nine of your town report. There is a correction in article nine that should read business personal property and not business personnel property. Good one. <laughs> Are there any other corrections to be noted in the published unofficial warning? Hearing none, unless there is an objection, I will waive the reading of the entire articles. The articles to be voted by Australian ballot are Article 1, to elect two select board members of the town of Morristown, one for a term of three years and one for a term of two years. Article 2, shall the voters approve a non-binding resolution to change the official name of the town of Morristown to the town of Morrisville. The polling place for the Australian ballot is in the community meeting room of the municipal building at 43 Portland Street. The ballot box was declared open at 8 o'clock this morning and shall remain open until 7 o'clock this evening. We will now move to conduct the traditional open session of the annual town meeting. To vote on articles, you must be a registered Morristown voter. If you have not done so already, please pass through the checklist on my right and receive a colored voting ballot that you will show during a voice vote from the floor or deposit it at the ballot box located in front of the days if a vote by paper ballot is called. If a paper ballot vote is requested, you will be given instructions on the procedure. The first order of business is Article 3, to elect a moderator of the town meeting for the ensuing year. David Polo has been your town moderator for the past 17 years and is not seeking re-election. It'd be nice to have a round of applause for David in his service. <laughs> Nominations are now in order for one to serve as moderator until the next town meeting. Are there any nominations? Um, I'm Dick Sargent and I would like to nominate Shap Smith I feel if he can handle the legislature, he ought to be able to handle us. Thank you. I have Shap Smith's name has been placed in nomination. I have a second. Are there any other nominations? Hearing none, all in favor of electing Shap Smith as your moderator for the e ensuing year, signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed, say no. You have elected Shap Smith as your moderator. Welcome, Shap.
Well, thank you very much. I will confess to be a little bit nervous. It's actually harder to be in front of all the people you grew up with than it is to be at the State House. I want to also thank uh, Dave Polo, who um, has done a great job as the moderator for the last several years, 17, um, and who encouraged me to uh, run for this office. So I'm first going to talk a little bit about how the uh, meeting will proceed. Uh, the town meeting is governed by Robert's Rules of Order. Um, they're the basic rules of order for the meeting, except where Vermont law takes precedence. I would note that the body cannot change Vermont state law, but you can change Robert's rules with a two-thirds vote if you desire. You can see um, on page 12 in your town report for information about that. An article must be moved and seconded by the body, then restated by the moderator before it is under consideration and the debate on the article may begin. After the moderator restates the motion, the person who made the motion has the right to speak first in the debate. Articles may only have one amendment at a time associated with them. And amendments to an article likewise may have only one amendment at a time associated with them. After you've spoken on a particular article, you will not be recognized a second time during discussion on that article or amendment until all other voters who wish to speak on the issue for the first time are given an opportunity to do so. Robert's Rules only allows a given speaker to speak twice on a given motion and limits the duration of speeches to 10 minutes. A division of the House can be requested by one wo voter before or after a voice vote. Vermont state law provides for a paper ballot vote on the request of seven voters, unless the town has made other arrangements. All motions, remarks, and discussion, including moving the previous question, must be addressed to the moderator. Anyone wishing to speak must come forward to the microphone in the center aisle and state his or her full name and speak into the microphone so that comments may be heard by the entire assembly. If you cannot get to the center aisle, a portable microphone can be brought to you by a Boy Scout member. Your speeches must be confined to the merits of the question. You will not be allowed to engage in personal attacks on a member of the body or their motives. Vermont state law prohibits consideration of articles that have not been warned. This means you cannot take binding action under the article other business, and you can't amend warned articles such that they would deal with business that hasn't been warned. Reconsideration of an article is allowed by Vermont state law until a point is reached where the body has begun working on another article. This means that if you have voted down an article, a motion can be made to reopen reconsideration of this article by a person on the prevailing side. And I will have to ask um, how you voted if you seek to um, reconsider a motion. However, once the next article is on the floor, no more action can be taken regarding the previous article at this meeting. Now, my role as a moderator is to help you accomplish the business you intend to do. Please ask questions if you don't understand what is happening or if you think what is happening is wrong for some reason or if you want to do something but you don't know how to proceed. Feel free to tell me if you feel I am, real, uh, I am ruling improperly. My children certainly do and I won't <laughs> mind it here. You have the right to challenge the moderator's rulings. Only registered votes, voters of the town may vote at annual or special meetings of the town. Non-residents and unregistered voters may be allowed to speak with the approval of two-thirds of the assembly. During a voice vote, please remain silent. Additionally, you may not raise your hands or stand if a physical count is required. We appreciate your cooperation. So Article 4 is the first matter that we will consider. It's in town meeting to elect all town officers required by law except for those officers to be elected by Australian ballot under Article 1 above. The term of office is for one year unless otherwise notice, noted and begins at the close of town meeting. 
These officers may be elected by voice vote, except for the officer of Lister. For that position, the assembly may ask the clerk to cast one vote for the elected candidate. Seconds are not necessary for the nominations. Motions for nominations to cease and the clerk cast one ballot are not necessary. If those serving are present, please stand and be recognized. We've been asked if uh, people who are running for town officers would stand and explain why they want that office. So now nominations are now in order for the election of first constable. First constable is, uh, may serve as district court officer and may remove disorderly people from town meeting. Nominations are now uh, in order for first constable. Nominee Eric Dodge. Uh, the name of Eric Dodge has been uh, placed in nomination for first constable. Are there any other nominations? Eric, would you like to explain why you would like to be first constable? Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> I have been. It's on. It's on. I've been first constable now for 10 years or more, and I have done nothing. <laughs> 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 so it's first constable, it, it, again, that is a legislatively uh, created position that every town has to have one. I was uh, first asked to be the first constable because I was a full-time law enforcement officer at the time. Uh, in many communities around the state, there have been issues with first constables uh, exercising authority that they were not given. Our authority comes from the board, select board. So it was uh, deemed appropriate because of my law enforcement background to uh, maybe the first constable um, with the understanding that I would defer all animal complaints to Brian, an uh, animal control officer, and I would uh, take no actions because there is no authority given to the first constable's position here in Morrisville. It is simply that we have to fill the position and uh, you are safe in assuming that I will not take any actions as your first constable. <laughs> uh, the name of Eric Dodge has been placed uh, nomination for first constable. Are there any other nominations? Seeing none, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Let's pose nay. And Eric Dodge has been elected uh, first constable. Second constable. A second constable may serve as district court officer and may remove disorderly people from town meeting. Are there any nominations? The name of Garth Christensen has been uh, placed in nomination. Are there any other nominations? Mr. Christensen, do you want to explain why you would like to have the position? Do I have to? <laughs> so I was requested by the chief to be second constable. I've been an officer here for 24 years now. Um, along with Eric, I hope to not have to do anything. <laughs> The name of Garth Christensen has been placed in nomination for second constable. Are there any other nominations? Seeing none, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed, nay. The ayes appear to have it. If the ayes do have it, and you have elected Garth Christensen as second constable. We'll now move on to grand juror. A grand juror is responsible for inquiring into and providing information to the proper authorities of criminal offenses. Their office is mostly, <laughs> this office is mostly obsolete. The state's attorneys provide most of the criminal investigation, but it is a uh, required office under state law. Currently, uh, the position is filled by uh, Richard Sargent. Are there any nominations for grand juror? Uh, the name of Richard Sargent has been placed in nomination for grand juror. 
Are there any other nominations? Uh, Mr. Sargent, would you like to explain why you would like to be grand juror? <laughs> The office is not too burdensome. <laughs> it seems to be a theme here. The, the, the only case I ever dealt with as grand juror, uh, Brian and I went over to the court and some fellows said that uh, his dog was not running around and Brian produced a video that showed his dog was running around. <laughs> and so I have a 100% record. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks to Brian, actually. The name of Richard Sargent has been placed in nomination for grand juror. Are there any other nominations? Seeing none, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed, nay. Uh, Richard Sargent has been elected grand juror. We now move on to town agent. Uh, for the purpose of conveying real estate, um, the town agent executes deeds on behalf of the town. Todd Thomas is currently serving. It is for a one-year term. Are there any nominations for the town agent to convey real estate? The name of Todd Thomas has been placed in nomination for the town agent to convey real estate. Are there any other nominations? Todd, would you like to explain why you would? I'm currently also the village agent to convey real estate. Um, if anyone wants a job, I'll probably vote for you, so. <laughs> Are there any other nominations for town agent to convey real estate? <laughs> Seeing none, all those in favor of electing Todd Thomas as town agent to convey real estate, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Ayes appear to have it. The ayes do have it. You have elected Tom Thomas, uh, Todd Thomas as the town agent to convey real estate. The next office is town agent to prosecute and defend suits. The town agent can act as a liaison between the select board and selected attorneys. It is a one-year term. Uh, Richard Sargent is currently serving in that position. Are there any nominations? The name of Richard Sargent has been placed in nomination for the position of town agent to prosecute and defend suits. Are there any other nominations? Mr. Uh, Sargent? The virtue of this office is that it's even less burdensome than the grand jury. <laughs> the name of Richard Sargent has been placed in a nomination for uh, the position of town agent to prosecute and defend suits. Are there any other nominations? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. aye. All those opposed, nay. The ayes appear to have it, the ayes do have it, and you have elected Richard Sargent as the town agent to prosecute and defend suits. The next office is trustee of public funds. The trustee of public funds manages, invests, and reports on real and personal property held in trust by the town. It is a term of three years, and Angela Norder is currently serving in that position. Are there any nominations for the position of trustee of public funds? The uh, name of Angela Norder has been placed in nomination for trustee of public funds. Are there any other nominations? Is Angela here? Given that there are no other uh, nominations, the uh, question is, shall Angela Norder be uh, elected trustee of public funds? Are you ready for that question? If so, all those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed, nay. The ayes appear to have it. The ayes do have it. You have elected Angela Norder as trustee of public funds. Now we have position of Lister. The Lister appraises property within the town for purposes of property tax increase or assessment. 
Uh, it is a vote for a one uh, for one person to serve for three years. It is by ballot. The uh, Richard Tomlinson is currently serving and is not seeking re-election. Are there any nominations? I nominate Paul Griswold. The name of Paul Griswold has been placed in nomination for the position of Lister. Are there any other nominations? <clears throat> Paul, would you like to uh, speak to why you would like to be the lister? I just finished uh, 26 years of <coughs> serving on the Planning Commission, not continuous, but in two different terms. And also during the last 50, 55 years, <coughs> I've served on a number of other committees. And I understand that the Lister's office is getting somewhat reorganized with the, with the uh, resignation of Charlie McCarthy. And I think that it would be who, me, but I would like to be the one to bring some local historical knowledge of our town to that office as the new people take over. The name of Paul Griswold has been placed in nomination for uh, Lister. Are there any other nominations? Seeing none, all those in favor of electing uh, Paul Griswold to the position of Lister, please say aye. 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 Opposed nay. The ayes appear to have it. The ayes do have it. And you've elected Paul Griswold to the position of Lister. We now have a uh, position of library trustees. The trustees are responsible for managing the library. There are two library trustees. Each have a term of five years. The current trustees are Kim Whitcomb and Jennifer Faith. Are there any nominations for the position of library trustee? Jack, Jack? I'd like to nominate Kim Whitcomb and Jennifer Faith. The names of Kim Whitcomb and Jennifer Faith have been placed in nomination for the position of library trustee. Are there any other nominations? And are they here? They're not. They have served well and faithfully and are willing to continue, and I think that's to their credit. Okay. Are there any other nominations? <coughs> Seeing none, the question is, shall Kim Whitcomb and Jennifer Faith be elected uh, trustees? of the library. You ready for that question? So all those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed nay. The ayes appear to have it. The ayes do have it. And you've elected Kim Whitcomb and Jennifer Faith as library trustees. We'll now move on to Article 5. Article 5, it, uh, the question is, will the town vote to pay members of the select board a salary, and if so, in what amount? So uh, the question is, um, do I have a, is it, will someone move that? Okay, is there a second for that? Second. And the question uh, is, uh, shall the uh, town vote to pay members of the select board a salary, and if so, in what amount? Someone uh, willing to offer an amendment as to the amount? The current annual expense for uh, select board salary is $7,500, which equals $1,500 per member per year. Is anybody willing to amend Article 5 to insert an amount uh, to be paid for select board salaries. I'll withdraw my motion. And you can start over. Okay. Uh, so the question is, uh, so Article 5 is, will the town vote to pay members of the select board a salary? And if so, in what amount? Would you like to propose an amendment? I will. Yes. 
I would like to propose that the town vote to pay the select board a uh, salary of fifteen hundred dollars a month. Fifteen hundred dollars a month or a year. A year. <laughs> <You're significant. laughs> so uh, it has been moved that the town pay members of the select board a salary of fifteen hundred dollars per year. Um, is there a second? Second. Is there any discussion? If not, the question is, shall the town pay members of the select board a salary of $1,500 per year? Are you ready for that question? Yes. If so, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 I'll suppose nay. The ayes appear to have it. The ayes do have it. And you have elected to pay uh, select board members a salary of $1,500 a year. Article 6 is, will the town vote to authorize the select board to establish a reserve fund for utilizing the surplus or money left over in the highway or municipal funds and authorize the select board to spend said funds for defraying future town expenses? Do I have a motion? I move Article 6. Article 6 has been moved. Is there a second? It has been seconded. Is there any debate? If not, all those in favor of adopting Article 6, please say aye. 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 Those opposed, nay. The ayes appear to have it. The ayes do have it. And you have adopted Article 6. Article 7 is, will the town vote real and personal property taxes to be paid to the treasurer in two equal installments? Oh, excuse me. Excuse me, Shaq. Yes. I'd like to amend Article 6. I'd like to make a motion to spend $50,000 on sidewalk replacement for the village. Michael, we, so we had already voted on it. Um, did you vote? to uh, vote in the affirmative? Yes, because I, uh, I think an appropriate motion would be a motion to reconsider Article 6. Okay. I would like to make a motion to reconsider Article 6 with an amendment. I think we would have to first uh, have a successful motion to reconsider, and then uh, we could uh, provide an amendment to it. Okay, so let's make a motion to reconsider okay. Article 6. So uh, a motion to reconsider uh, Article 6 has been made. Is there a second? Second. Could you identify who, the person who seconded? Susan Sinnott, Morrisville, Vermont. Okay, sorry. It's hard for us to see, so. Um, okay, so the... The um, matter before the uh, body is, shall we reconsider uh, the vote on Article 6? Uh, and it is open for debate. Would you like to explain why? I would like, let me ask you first, Chef. I should have made the amendment before Article 6 was approved. The reason we have the rules is so that we well, can I, then change I, them afterwards, yeah. I think last year I did it after it was approved, but anyway, right. I'll make sure. That, so, yes, I would like to take $50,000 of this reserve money and do sidewalk repair. So the question is, shall Article 6 uh, be reconsidered, or decision on Article 6 be reconsidered? Are you ready for that question? If so, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed, nay. 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 I think the nays appear to have it. Division. Okay. There has been a request for a division. All those in favor of reconsideration, please rise.
those, uh, those, all those opposed, please rise. Please listen to the results of your vote. Those voting uh, for reconsideration, 60. Those voting against reconsideration, 46. And uh, you have agreed to reconsider Article 6. Hi, Sonny Brink, uh, Morrisville, Vermont. I'm just a little bit confused. Article 9 last year, um, we did the same thing, and it was passed. Did we use the, did we use the 50,000? Our funds, or do we do something with that? I'm looking in the town report on page 88 on Article 9. It's pretty much the exact same scenario that we have right now. So um, I, I, that is an appropriate question, but we don't currently have a motion on the floor because we just decided the question of motion to reconsider. So there's there needs to be a motion uh, for the next. Uh, the question of whether it will be amended, um, and then it will be appropriate for debate and questioning with regard to the article that's in front of us. So hold that thought, and um, once we've got a new motion on the floor, then I think it will be appropriate for uh, discussion. Okay, thanks, Sonny. I'd like to make a motion to amend Article 6. $50,000 for sidewalk repair. So there has been a motion to amend Article 6 to um, authorize the town to spend $50,000 for sidewalk, sidewalk repair um, out of the reserve fund in addition to the amounts that are used to defray future town expenses. Replacement or repair. Yes. Um, can we just first actually have a motion? I, Lee, I couldn't, I couldn't hear you. We have a motion on the floor. Do you want it restated? We have $50,000 in reserve funds. Okay. So I think it will be appropriate once we've actually had, we have a current motion on the floor. Um, the question is, is that motion seconded? I'll second it. The motion has been seconded. Who was who that? Sarah Corpulis, And now uh, the matter is open for discussion and debate. That would, um, and Lee, it would be appropriate. It, people should be coming forward and asking questions now. So I, I, my question, I guess, was from Article 9 from last year. Min uh, did the, said the exact same thing, and we approved it. Did, where did the, did we give the money for sidewalks? Where, where are we with last year's, I guess? Because it seems like we're, we're it's redundant. Sean. Okay. We did use some of the money for sidewalk. We um, we had to use half of it. We're, there's a plan to use the other half, but so far we used um, twenty-five thousand fifty-three dollars and sixty-two cents. So we have twenty-four thousand nine sixty-four available still for sidewalks, and we did uh, a section 
on Main Street from the Senior Center to the fire station. That's what's been used out of the money so far. Okay, thank you. Ellen Waldman from Marsco. Um, I'm just wondering what actually would happen if we allot $50,000 and then it says um, there's going to be money that for deferring future town expenses. What if all the money is used for sidewalks and there's more funds that are needed for what are those future town expenses possibly and how much money is in this reserve? I know how much is in it from the 50000 that was put aside for last year, but, you know, what, um, it just seems like it's so ambiguous. Thank you. Okay. Our unassigned fund balance as of, uh, well, 630, 2018 was 433952 um, That fund could be used for many, many different things. Um, it could be a piece of equipment that breaks, it could be um, some sort of road failure, it could be anything. And um, our auditors encourage us to have a lot more than that in our reserve fund. And um, we, we typically do kind of the bare minimum. I know it sounds like a lot of money, but it's really not. And we're always encouraged every year we have an audit that we should have more set aside. But that's what's in it right now, 433000 Since we're on the sidewalks, didn't we pass a few years ago under the highway budget about doing the sidewalk from town to Bishop Marshall? I think it was under the highway budget. And why was that never done? Sidewalk from A Street down to uh, A Street was built this year. There's a future sidewalk, as Lee referred to, from B Street to Bishop Marshall. We uh, got a preliminary approval from the state for the scoping study, but we haven't allocated any funds to actually build that sidewalk yet. So, money is the answer. Lee. Grace Maniati, Morrisville. How much is the total reserve that we would be moving with Article 6 versus the 50000 that we'd be setting aside for the sidewalks? Do you have a preliminary number? The question is how much we're going to be using? Huh? No, how much would we be moving in Article 6 to the capital reserve? That, that's what we're voting on with Article 6 versus setting aside the $50,000. So what is the difference between the two numbers? Well, we have 24000 right now in that sidewalk reserve. I understand that. But if we're voting Article 6 to move all of the remainder of the reserve from this year into a capital reserve, how much are we taking out of that transfer to the due to the sidewalks, the 50000 What would be going to this $433,000 to increase that amount. That's not determined. You don't have a preliminary number at this point? We don't, do we, Dan? If, yeah, we're, we wouldn't know that number till the end of this fiscal year that we're in. Right. So we don't even know if we have the $50,000. Well, we have the twenty-four. I understand that, but the amendment was for sidewalks, 50000 If we don't know if we even have 50000 <laughs> We have it. Okay. Go ahead, Dan. Uh, Dan, could you... Uh, it, uh, unless people object uh, to uh, Dan speaking, uh, given the fact that he's a non-resident, um, we're going to allow him to clarify that. Um, I would say, while we're waiting for Dan, if people would turn to, turn to page 25. Uh, and there's been a couple questions. I, you know, I just want to kind of explain this piece of the budget because it is complicated. Um, I think the, the first question is: Yes, the fifty thousand dollars was set aside at the end of last fiscal year, 
So that's what the motion was last year. So at the end of the year, in this current year, we had the motion made and we set aside $55,000, or $50,000, excuse me, for sidewalks. I think they've already said how much they spent out of that. So the reason why it won't show up in the town report for this year is because this closed out the that fiscal year. So at the end of this year's fiscal report, you'll see what was left over from that $50,000 and you know, anything that you may decide to add to that, or actually, no, that wouldn't be the case. So on page 25, you'll see all the different reserve accounts that we have. We will not know exactly how much we will have in a reserve fund until the end of the fiscal year. So it is a little bit, you're voting for the select board to do something with that for next fiscal year, which is what this budget cycle is about. Is that helpful? Thank you. Hi, Amy Town, Morrisville, Morristown, Morrisville, whatever. Um, so I guess I'm a little perplexed about this because we did vote last year to um, move some of the surplus to the sidewalks. Why is it now two years in a row that we're moving money from surplus to take care of sidewalks? Why wasn't sidewalks maintenance and creation part of the original budget? It just seems like poor budgeting. I, I, I'm a little confused by all of this and so I just want to know why sidewalks was it in the original budget to begin with? Why why do we have to count on surplus to maintain our sidewalks when we know that that's an existing issue? Can someone from the select board speak to that? There is another additional twenty nine thousand dollars in this year's budget uh, for sidewalks maintenance and repair. So, um, you know. That is correct. Is that, is that right, Jean? Yes. Yeah, so there's another, and that, that covers, you know, mostly the expenses that we have to uh, purchase. That doesn't include our labor, you know, so that's, that's concrete, topsoil, all those other things, you know, that we need to do to build sidewalks. And, and also, we have a, it's a maintenance plan for roads and sidewalks that we consider all the time. Like we did, when we redid Maple Street, we redid all the sidewalks. We're, we're doing um, more sidewalks on Congress Street, we redid that. We, we look at all of it, you know, we don't just only put sidewalks down when we have money allotted for it. There's a plan with, that everything happens. But as you know, all the roads need work, and we've had a plan for the roads and the sidewalks, and it's just a matter of getting the time and the money to do it. Monty. Hi, Monty Mason, Morrisville. I just wanted to uh, get a clarification. Is the uh, crosswalks part of the sidewalk type of construction here in town? You know, the marking of the sidewalk, the crosswalks or anything? Well, that's not part of the sidewalk, but that's something we do as needed. We try to do it a couple times a year uh, or as needed. You know, the paint gets worn off pretty often. Right. Well, the reason I'm asking is because uh, I know we got some bad sidewalks here, especially up by the graded building here. It's pretty rough up through there. Um, they, they do need some work, and, and, I, and I, I applaud the, the town for doing what they have done with the streets and stuff. They've done a great job so far. The, uh, the main street needs it too, but um, my, my main question with the, with the crosswalk was because it seems like those, those lines in the crosswalk, as well as even in the center of the road, aren't lasting like they used to back years ago. And I don't know if it's because of the paint that's being used or the excess travel, there's more travel now than it used to be. But uh, <clears throat> the, the crosswalks aren't marked very well. And I've seen a number of times when people are starting to come across the crosswalk that uh, they're almost hit by cars coming down Main Street. So uh, what I'm trying to say is that those lines are almost invisible within a month or two after they're put down, where the traffic goes through, and the signs that are next to the, the sidewalks indicating as a crosswalk there aren't very well uh, uh, visible either from traffic coming down through, especially if there's a truck parked next to the sidewalk there, you can't see, it blocks the signs. So it's, it's kind of a hazard spot right there, and I was wondering if maybe part of the sidewalk uh, 
talk we're having now could be uh, set aside or made a priority to make those more visible for people that are crossing. Thanks. Thanks, Bonnie. Sounds good. Mary Ann Wilson, Morristown. Um, I'm looking at page 49 in the town report, and it does show sidewalk construction of 29,000. So I, my question, I have two parts to the question. One is, if you have 29,000 already budgeted, and you have 25,000 uh, left over from that reserve, and now we're going to add another 50,000. So we've got about 100,000 uh, for sidewalks. And I think that's great. But tell me where those sidewalks are going to be repaired, replaced, or put down, please. Um, just so everybody understands, and I'm going to throw a little bit of the paving schedule for um, the summer out, just so everybody understands what's going on around the town. Um, next summer, there's been a project I've been working with the state on for probably the last two years, and all the Class 1 highways within the village, and that's Class 1 highways are um, the state designated highways, so it would be from, it's a little long explanation, but I think it's the best way for me to explain it, would be from the city of Jersey Heights, Main Street, um, all the way through the downtown, up to the Veterans Memorial, um, out Park Street to the vault, and then um, on Elmore Street, Main Street, up towards this way, all the way to the Mars, um, all Portland Street and down to Bridge Street will be repaved, and then Bridge Street to Brooklyn, and then Brooklyn out to just the other side of Carroll Avenue. So all those things are going to be repaved this summer. They're going to grind about two inches and, and then repave all those things. And then any of the things that you find where we have a crosswalk um, that's not quite ADA compliant, they're going to fix all those things too. As part of that project, um, I've convinced them to put, you've seen the flashing uh, crosswalk sign that's up by the town offices, they're going to put one of those there at the senior center and a bump out there to help our senior citizens. There's, there's an amazing amount of good things that go on at the senior center. Um, and they're going to put one of those there to help the senior citizens get across. Um, and then they'll repaint all of our lines. Um, I will say, tell you though on fresh asphalt, especially fresh asphalt, there's a little thin layer on top of that and paint doesn't stick well. They have changed some of the paint types over the years and some of the more durable paints are actually no longer available to us. So and it is a continual maintenance problem to do that. So we do our best to keep up with it. We get in every year as early as we can in the spring and repaint all that stuff. Um, so what that's going to do is it's going to make it hard for us next year. We've had a plan to continue our way out Main Street to rebuild all those sidewalks out of Main Street. Well, with the paving project going on, it's going to be hard for us to get in there and work because we're going to have other contractors in there working. And generally speaking, having two contractors in one spot working is not a great idea because if you slow one down, especially us, if we slow down the state project, then we'd be liable for that responsible for any delays that they would have. So our plan next year working with the street forum is to redo, you know, as much as we can on Congress Street and get that finished up. And then next year is continue to work our way, especially on the main trunk lines um, on Main Street. And that's what we did this year. You know, we worked um, from the senior center on out, you know, up to the fire station. I think we spent just around $25,000 of the reserve fund on that. And we're going to continue next year to do some of the side streets on uh, or sidewalks on the side streets. So that's the broad picture to a certain degree of what is going on in the downtown, excuse me, next year with paving and sidewalks. Lee. I still don't understand Todd's answer because it says on page 25, assigned funds, Route 100 sidewalk project, $191,574. And if there are assigned funds, sure. Um, that was the A Street to B Street project that we finished up this summer. And the reason why, once again, that money was set aside, you know, that was what was available for that whole project that we did last summer for that, re that reconstruction project that we did. So that, 100, that was as of June 30th. 
of 2018. And then we rebuilt that section and we spent all of that, or almost all of that, um, on that, that section of road that we rebuilt, where there's a brand new sidewalk and a brand new section of road. Does that help? Yeah. Dave. David Callister in Morristown. I would assume, Bob, you said we spent about 50% of the money that was allocated last year from the reserve fund. I would assume that we only spent 50% because it wasn't a planned project and so the labor wasn't there. I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm totally in support of what Min is saying and trying to reinvest in the infrastructure. I just don't know if it makes sense to designate money this year if it's not part of the plan and if the labor isn't going to be there to actually invest the money. That it might make more sense to try to revisit that next year or allocate some future funds when you could, because we, we voted for it last year and we only invested 50% of the funds because I'm guessing it was a labor force planned project timing issue more than it was having the money available. Is that fair? Yeah. <coughs> okay, I wanted to uh, just say to what Marianne said. Uh, last year we spent, not counting what we already budgeted and regular maintenance, Fifty thousand dollars around. Now we want to add another fifty to it, which means we're going to have a hundred thousand dollars. And once you do this, that means you have to spend it on sidewalks. And what if something else does come up? I'm not against sidewalks, and I think we should have people coming forward if you see something that needs to be done and have us budget it into the regular budget rather than taking the reserve. That reserve is there, like Bob said, they encourage us to have a bigger reserve in case something goes wrong, like a big culprit or something like that. So that's all I'm saying. So the question before us is whether Article 6 should be amended to allocate $50,000 of the um, surplus to uh, sidewalk repairs. So the question is, shall Article 6 be amended as stated? Are you ready for that question? If so, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed nay. Nay. The nays appear to have it. The nays do have it. And you have declined to amend Article 6 as proposed. So the question is, shall Article 6 be adopted. Are you ready for that question? So all those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. As opposed nay. Nay. The ayes appear to have it. The ayes do have it. <coughs> then you have adopted Article 6. Article 7 uh, states, will the town vote real and personal property taxes to be paid to the treasurer in two equal installments with delinquent taxes and assessments having charged against them an 8% penalty after the second installment and interest charges of 1% per month or fraction thereof for the first three months and thereafter 1.5% per month or fraction thereof from the due date of such tax. Such interest shall be imposed on a fraction of a month as if it were an entire month uh, per 32 VSA section 5. 136. Payments are due in the hands of the treasurer by 4 p.m. on the due dates. Only official USPS cancellation marks will be accepted as postmarked mail per 32 VSA section 4773. Per its delinquent tax policy and Vermont statutes, 32 VSA section 5252, the town will immediately begin legal proceedings by turning all outstanding account balances over to an attorney for collection. The first installment to be paid will be due on or before November 15th, 2019, and the second installment to be paid will be due on or before May 15th, 2020. Do I hear a motion to adopt Article 7? So moved. Second. Yep. There's been a, uh, Article 7 has been moved and seconded, and the question is, shall Article 7 be adopted? Are you ready for that question? If so, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 
All those opposed, nay. The ayes appear to have it. The ayes do have it, and you have adopted Article 7. Article 8 states, will the town vote to authorize the total expenditures of $6,510,960 for the operation of the town with the total of $5,546,301 to be raised by taxes. And the uh, select board's budget is uh, set forth in the, um, in the town report. Do I have a motion? So moved? By who, who moved it? Okay. Is there a second? Hmm? Okay. So articles, uh, Article 8 has been moved and seconded. Question is, shall Article 8 be adopted? Are you ready for that question? Is there any discussion? Is there any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor of adopting Article 8, please say aye. Aye. Those opposed, nay. The ayes appear to have it. The ayes do have it. You adopted Article 8. Article 9 is will the town vote to exempt business personal property at an increasing amount of 25% per year until 100% of business personal property is exempt. Do I have a motion to adopt Article 9? Is there a second? Article 9 has been moved and seconded. Is there any discussion? Yes, my name is Kevin Bracey, Morristown. Can somebody explain what this means and what the repercussions are of it? <laughs> so the business personal property tax is, um, I'm going to try to think of a good example. I'm going to use a brewery for example. Um, so when the brewer sets up in Morristown, they buy a lot of brewing equipment. It's very expensive. Um, Morristown has uh, on its rolls uh, the ability to tax that business personal property. Um, think of freezers, shelves at Hannaford's. Um, all of those things that are out there that we level a, 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 a business personal property tax on. We're probably one of the things, Sarah did some research, one of the maybe 25 towns or so in the state of Vermont um, that still levy that tax. Um, I'm not going to, uh, so the, the question is right now, I think we raise roughly $100,000, $97,000 a year in that tax. Um, there has been some concern about the impact to businesses. So the question is, um, to the voters, would you like to exempt that? Now what happens if you exempt it? So that, that over the years, um, that, prop, that tax, will transition to the overall property tax. So that business personal property tax would go away. But that $100,000 in revenue over the next four years divided equally would go to the, the regular property tax. Any questions that I can help with? I know it's complicated. Um, yeah, so I run in Morristown. So does that include inventory? No, the inventory tax was done away with a long time ago, so there's no inventory tax. So in other words, this is just for, as you said, like major end item components of a business, such right. as the ovens, such as the air conditioning, such as the heating, such as the cooling it, system, all that. I don't think heating counts. and cooling systems, that's part of the, the um, I'm not an expert on this, that's part of the building. So you know, think of stuff, and if there's, there's any listers out there, you might be able to help me with this more too. Um, I think it's stuff that's not boiled down. So the things you talk about were HVAC systems or air stuff, that's part of a building tax. So that's part of the property tax already. This is not an inventory tax. Um, think about um, a, you know, a, a lathe at a, a metal shop. So or machine tools. Machine tools. That's a perfect example. That's the reason why I tried to use um, brewing equipment. Our shelves in a grocery store 
are the freezers and refrigerators in the grocery like store. Like a POS machine. Uh, I'm sorry? Like a POS machine. I'm point not sure. Of sale, point of sale machine. So can I just um, encourage people to, if they're going to speak, to come to the microphone and identify themselves for the uh, record? Thanks. Charlie. Charles MacArthur. I am the head lister in Morristown. And the personal business property tax is anything used to earn income with that business that is not affixed to the building. Anything affixed to the building is part of the real estate. And inventory is exempt. So folks, the reason we brought this to you for a vote is because we have no way of policing the levels at which are reported to us as personal property tax or personal property within the business. So we don't send anybody out to Hannaford's and Price Chopper, I'm picking on them because they're the two big grocery stores in town, to see what they actually have if it matches to what they're reporting to us. It has become clear to us that there is a discrepancy in what is being reported and we have no way of enforcing that. It's an honor system. It is unfair in that those two stores, uh, in reporting their personal business, pr uh, business property tax for us to tax, is uh, there's a discrepancy. The stores are relatively equal in size, but one store is paying a larger portion into this tax than the other one is. We have no way of knowing which store is giving us a, a more accurate accounting. And that, that transfers across every business in town. So if you're an accounting firm and you have computers, uh, if you know any office equipment that you use to generate your funds, that is a property that gets taxed. We have no way of going out and putting a fairness to this because we don't have a way of accounting for it. So it's an honor system payment. We just felt this $100,000 that we generate in taxes, if we reduce it 25% per year for a four-year period of time, it'll, it relieves the businesses from having to pay that tax to start with. It takes away the unfairness of it because there's no way of, of policing it. And we would slowly absorb that $100,000 into the real property tax within the town as we, as we went forward. I hope that helps to clear up why we're bringing this to you. Dave McAllister, Morristown. Is the select board aware of any potential businesses that have not located here to our community because of this tax? So in other words, I guess my question is, is would this, would this offer some additional incentive to have businesses set up shop and relocate here potentially, which creates jobs, creates extra tax revenue in other ways. It, it, uh, it could be a deciding factor. Um, like Dan said, we're one of only maybe 25 towns in the state that still has this tax. Mm -hmm. So there's 200 and something towns that have done away with it. And that might be a deciding factor in a business coming. Um, it might make a big deal for somebody you know, another good example is like a bucket loader, Minosh bucket loader or an excavator or something like that. You know, they might go to a town and start that didn't have one. You know, it makes a difference to the bottom line. Yep. And that's really what we're trying to do is to help our businesses, mm -hmm. you know, reduce their outgo. Julia. Julia Campania, uh, Town of Morristown. I could speak to that briefly. I don't think we need to beat this topic to death, but I was a town administrator in a nearby town for 12 years, and I sold our, <laughs> our town on that basis. Look, we don't charge a personal property tax on businesses. Come here and, and come to our town and, and save that cost, especially for startup businesses. So it is, it is a factor as to whether somebody comes and locates here. So Article 9 has been moved and seconded. The question is, shall Article 9 be adopted? Are you ready for that question? If so, all those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed, nay. The ayes appear to have it. The ayes do have it, and you have adopted Article 9. 
Article 10 is, will the town vote to raise taxes equal to one cent on the grand list to be dedicated to a Morristown Fire Department Capital Equipment Fund? And just as a, uh, for your information, one cent raises approximately $63,565 on a 2018 grand list. So uh, do I have a motion to adopt Article 10? So moved. Uh, is there a second? second? Article 10 has been moved and seconded. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor of adopting Article 10, please say aye. 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 Suppose nay. Uh, as part of it, the ayes do have it, and you've adopted Article 10. Article 11 is, will the town vote to raise taxes equal to one cent on the grand list to be dedicated to a Morristown Highway Department Capital Equipment Fund. Do I have a motion? So moved. Uh, Article 11 has been moved. Is there a second? Second. Article 11 has been moved and seconded. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor of adopting Article 11? Please indicate by saying aye. Aye. As opposed to nay. The ayes do have it. The ayes do have it. You've adopted Article 11. <laughs> Article 12 is will the town vote to raise taxes equal to one half cent on the grand list to be dedicated to the Noise House Museum Repair and Maintenance Fund? And uh, one half cent raises approximately $31,783 on that 2018 grand list. Do I have a motion? Article 12 has been moved. Is there a second? Second. second. Article 12 has been moved and seconded. Is there any discussion? I just have a question. I'm not clear on are, are all these three just a one year thing or is this, but does this continue after? One year. One year. Thank you. So question, uh, Article 12 has moved, moved and seconded. Is there any further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor, please indicate by saying aye. Aye. As opposed to nay. The ayes appear to have it. The ayes do have it. You've adopted Article 12. Article 13 is, will the town vote to appropriate the sum of $97,969 for the following purposes? $2,900 to the Central Vermont Adult Basic Education. $900 to Central Vermont Community Action Council. $2,500 to Central Vermont Council on Aging, $1,750 to Clarina Howard Nichols Center, $5,763 to Green Mountain Transit, $1,000 for Justice for Dogs, $15,681 for Lamoille Home Health and Hospice, $2,500 for Lamoille County Civic Association, $5,000 for Lamoille County Food Share, $3,900 for Lamoille County Mental Health Community Connections, $12,000 for Lamoille County Youth Center, $4,000 for Lamoille Economic Development Council, $3,000 for Lamoille Family Center, $1,000 for Lamoille Housing Partnership, $1,500 for the Lamoille Restorative Center, $3,375 for Lamoille County Special Investigation Unit, $10,000 for Meals on Wheels of Lamoille County, $1,000 for the North Country Animal League, $4,000 for out and about adult daycare, $5,200 for the rural community transportation, $1,000 for retired senior volunteer program, and $10,000 for River Arts, and that's for a total of $97,969. The appropriations requested by the above agencies are not submitted to the select board for approval. The voters approve or disapprove the appropriations to these agencies. Because there has not been a request for an increased appropriation from the agencies listed, they have been presented in one article. You may deal with any of these appropriations individually or collectively, and Article 13 is divisible by a majority vote. Representatives from many of these organiza organizations may be on hand today to answer your questions. 
The question is, shall Article 13 be adopted? Is there a motion? Uh, has been moved for Article 13. Is there a second? Second. Second. Is there any discussion? Todd Thomas, Morrisville. Yep. We're a very generous community, and that's a wonderful thing. However, sorry, we're a very generous community. That's a wonderful thing. However, it's good to be prudent with tax dollars. We give more as a percentage of our budget than any other town in the county, including the larger area. Um, there's one social service provider that doesn't have a Morrisville office anymore. It's gone to Barry. So I would just, it's not something we can do at town meeting from my understanding. I would ask that the select board uh, moving forward ask these agencies to resubmit their signatures every three years to remain on this ballot. And I have no problem funding them, but I want to make sure they're actually still active in our community. Thank you. Is there further discussion? Yes. Right, Everett Fry, I'm in town of Morristown. Uh, my question is for the $3,375 for the Lamoille County Special Investigation Unit. Does that include money for SANE kits? SANE kits. Uh, right, so, and if I offend anybody here, I apologize in advance. So SANE, what SANE kits are is that when a person is sexually assaulted, it provides forensic nurses to perform examinations with which to gain forensic evidence for the prosecution of a sexual assault. Does everybody understand? So that's what I'm asking. I'm asking, does the Lamoille County Special Investigation Unit, does that also provide funding for say kids? Thank you. Is there anybody here um, who can speak to that issue? Say this. I'm not sure if anybody misunderstood the word you were using. It's not K-I-D-S, it's K-I-T-S, yes. correct? Oh, They're saying oh, kits, oh, not saying kids. Same kids, oh. same kits okay. yes. Oh. The kits themselves are an investigative tool. The hospitals have them. Specially trained nurses collect evidence from the victims. Those kits are then turned over to law enforcement and then uh, used for uh, possible prosecution. And I don't know the answer to the question whether or not the money that we're appropriating goes to fund those kits or not. Okay. Uh, Ed Lambert, uh, uh, I, I love the articles. They're all great, except I have one question. Is uh, what does River Arts do for $10,000 for us? I mean, what is it? That's personal. Is there anybody who can speak to that issue? Okay, here we go. the shorter mic. Um, my name is Nan Carl Beauregard and I am the president of the board this year for River Arts. And we are, we've had a really good year and the 10,000 that, um, that, that the town gives us helps to uh, provide scholarships for kids to come to camps, also for some of our older people to be able to take workshops and to do some field trips. We've served 3,500 people this year which is 5,000 more than we served last year. And we've been able to be part of the town in a number of um, uh, public art exhibits and uh, productions around town. So we really love being part of Morristown and Morrisville. And we, th we hope that we are good stewards of that 10,000 in leveraging the money that we get from other sources. If you have other questions, be very happy to answer. Is there further discussion? So um, I think the numbers you got were a little mixed up. How many people did you serve this year? We served, we had over, we had 3,500 unique people that came into River Arts for a variety of different Right, things. and how many more was that, that than was last 500 year? 500 more Okay, because I think you said 5,000. Oh, did I? <laughs> and it was oh, a little confusing, really I won't kid you. No, no. <laughs> like, wow. Well, no. And, <laughs> 
We would love to do that. <laughs> well, um, and the other question I had was, so when you're talking about scholarships, so the folks that you're serving, are they able to take all the classes for free? Are they, the elderly that you're caring for, are they able, does this money pay for them to be able to do it? It helps doing? to contribute to doing that, yes. For the most part, if somebody has a financial issue or some other kind of issue, we're able to find resources for that. Okay. So we really try very hard to be an arts uh, association for everyone in our area, regardless of, of um, ability or skill or um, or income. Okay. That's our that's our goal is arts for everyone. Thank you. Is there a further discussion on Article Thirteen? The the one thing I wanted to mention is that we've had every year we have this uh, list, and it's a great list and a lot of really good good donations. Um, we talked about having always trying to have a person on hand from that organization so they can speak of what they do. And I know for, for the most part there is, but I, I would like to make that one of the conditions is, so somebody is here so they can explain what the money's for. Um, you know, it's not just free money, like, like Todd says in that one case where, you know, the office is in Barry now. Um, we don't know that. And I think it would be great if that was one of the conditions of Article 13, is that a representative was on hand from every one of these places so we could question them. Is that an amendment? Yes, it is. <laughs> so uh, if I understand it correctly, uh, Bob, you are moving to amend Article 13 to require for appropriation a member of the organizations to be present to answer questions? Yes. And is that a future requirement or is that a? Yes. Okay. So, uh, Bob, or, uh, it, Article 13, there's a proposal to amend Article 13 to require the presence of representatives of the organization in the future to be present in order for them to uh, be able to secure an appropriation on behalf of the organization. Is there a second? Uh, that has been seconded. So the, that is that amendment is what is currently up for discussion, not the underlying article. Is there any discussion on that amendment? Marianne? Uh, my, my question is, if someone isn't here to talk about their specific project, does that mean the, the funds won't be appropriated? Yeah. Zero. Yeah. Zip. I, I applaud the select member's notion to do this. However, in particular with two organizations here, one being the Special Investigative Unit and the Clarina Howard Nichols Center, knowing that they have a very small staff and they're very, very active in our community, actively performing human services, nonprofit human services, especially with Clarina Howard Nichols Center, uh, I would solemnly ask that we amend that notion to in the event of an emergency and someone from the organization could not attend, could we still disperse funds to that organization, if you would be so kind? So moved on that amendment. Okay. So that has been further, uh, the amendment requiring attendance from a member of the organization for approval of funding has been further amended to allow um, appropriation where there is a determination that there is an emergency that prevents a member of the organization from being there. So we are now on an amendment to the amendment. I just have something to say about that. Darlene Chateau, Morrisville. Um, I never used to be able to come to town meetings because I didn't have the time off. It wasn't that I worked for a nonprofit, but I sort of think that if the representative can't be here, would a letter of something so that they don't get completely um, not part of it? Because it is hard for me to get this day off 
So I kind of think, make it a holiday for everyone in the state. I was just reminded uh, that we need a second on the uh, further amendment of uh, the amendment to Article 13. Is there a second to that? Second. Yeah, a second. Um, Ed Wilson, Morrisville. I, I just like people to consider that all of these organizations are, at least for the most part, are volunteer op operations. Some of them have uh, requests in different towns. All of this is being done by volunteers, which would have to take, who would have to take time off, do a great deal of preparation that might not be needed. I think that taking some responsibility upon ourselves to get the town report ahead of time, look it over, and if you have questions, do some investigation, and then bring those results to town meeting where it would be discussed. I, I just don't think it's as necessary to, uh, to request that much time of the people. We've spent a lot of time already on $97,000 where 6.5 million went through within a few seconds. Uh, just something to consider, thank you. Is there further discussion on the amendment to the amendment? And just so that I, you I think in the event that um, somebody couldn't be here, at least have a description written out um, as to what, what the money's for. You know, not just a free money thing. I know, like, you know, most of these organizations, I know there's people in the audience that represent them. And I know there's some that aren't represented here that should be. That's so, my point. So um, we're at the maximum of the number of times we can um, amend. <laughs> um, and what you said suggested a further amendment. So um, we'll have to leave that to future consideration. Yeah. I think this is Kate Greenman. From Kate Greenman from Morrisville. I'm just trying to figure out the mechanism of this. So would the person from the the agency requesting the money have to prove they're here? I mean, it seems kind of cumbersome. Is there further discussion? The people who have requested this money have gone out and gotten petitions from 5% of the Morristown voters for this request. We can change our process by saying, well, it, you can't be on here forever. Maybe you can only be on here for four years or five years. But I think it's a little over the top to say that everyone has to be here. One of the reasons that these are in one article is that we don't take forever talking about each one individually. Well, if we do what you're asking, we're going to have those anyway. We're going to have that anyway. So either put them all on an article or set a limit to the um, petition. Further discussion? Yes, Brian Kellogg. Okay, <clears throat> I agree with Mary Ann, I think, and Todd, maybe every three years have them come out with that petition again. So that way they, we know they're here, we know they're, what they're doing. But it, I highly suggest that somebody or some representative, it doesn't have to be a, they can designate somebody to be here because we don't know what all of these people do. And so they could be here to answer the question and if they're not here, and it's brought up, and the people start asking, then they can vote that one out themselves. We won't vote them out. They will, because you can vote down anybody's. Thank you. Further discussion? Sarah Russell, Morrisville. Um, page 91 of our reports is a breakdown of every organization that is part of the appropriations, discussing how they've used the money and the population they serve, and how they use the funds we appropriate. So in terms of a letter, I mean, we could ask for more details, but I think that people are saying what they're using their money for, and it's already in the report. So I'll just, I'll just remind folks um, that currently the uh, amendment that's up for discussion is whether we will allow people to be absent uh, should there be an emergency. We're not currently talking about the amendment about whether we're going to ask people to be here or not. So the appropriate 
um, thing for discussion is whether we want emergency uh, you to be able to be absent if, if there's an emergency. Are people ready for that question? If so, all those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. As opposed to nay. Nay. The ayes appear to have it. The ayes do have it. The question now is whether Article 13 shall be amended to require representatives of the organizations for which appropriations are being voted to be present at town meeting unless they can establish that there has been some emergency that uh, prevents them from being here. Is there a discussion on that amendment? Move the question. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, okay. Alan Waldman, I just have <clears throat> a question. What would the mechanism be to, to, to sort of police that? Like, would there be a sign-up sheet? Would there be a call for all the representatives to stand and announce who they represent? I just want to know what would be put in place, because just to say you have to be here, I mean, whether I agree with that or not, I just want to know how you're going to actually fo follow up with that. So that's it. David Bickford, uh, Morristown. I'm a member of the board of directors of the Moyle County Youth Center. Uh, we have been here and prepared to answer questions for the last several years. And we feel that it's important to have a presence, but I'm not sure about compelling a presence. So I'd urge you to vote no. David, David Ford, Morristown. I did read the town report. Many of you did as well. I saw the descriptions of all of these organizations. I know the process they use to get onto this list. I know the reason for the list. And this, to me, represents the heart of Morristown in many ways. It's our caring for everything from animals to people. It shows our heart. I'm opposed to the amendment. I urge us to defeat it now. Monty. Monty Mason, Morrisville. Uh, I'd like to echo the previous uh, man that was standing here. Uh, also, I was looking at going through these and looking at them and there's one on here, it's one of the major ones, it's uh, Lamoille Home Health and Hospice. Uh, that, that agency really does a tremendous uh, service to our town and our communities around us. I'd hate to think that they would, could risk losing uh, funds by uh, not having someone here to answer a question. So I, I just think that we have to be careful what we wish for. Thank you. Is there any further discussion on the amendment? Seeing none, all those in favor of amending Article 13 to require the presence of um, someone from the organization except in an emergency for approval of the appropriation, please say aye. Aye. All those opposed, nay. Nay. The nays appear to have it. The nays do have it and you have declined to amend Article 13 as proposed. So the question is, shall uh, Article 13 be adopted? Are you ready for that question? Yes. Uh, Chivalia, a companion more sound. So would this be the proper um, point to introduce an amendment to implement Todd and Marian's suggestion of the three-year rule. Is this appropriate or should we do it under other business? And I'm happy to bring it up under other business if it's easier. Julie, what I'd like to suggest, I, I think we're hearing a concern, maybe not from the whole body, but the concern that organizations on here know one that doesn't have a presence in our community right now. And that is a concern the tax dollars are leaving our community and not staying here. I agree that this is the heart of our community here, but I do believe there should be some mechanism put into the process right. which we can come here as a board to you at town meeting and say, 
these organizations are in our community, they are providing the function that they describe in our town report. I think we can do that as a board, outside of town meeting, at a regular board meeting, we'll be warned if, somebody yeah. want, if folks want to come and chime in. But I do think there's a valid concern that organizations year after year show up on the list and they, they have a description in the town report, but we want to ensure that the tax dollars are, are going where they're indicated. Right. So I think as a board, we can, we can work on this in a regular board meeting and therefore, we wouldn't need an amendment. We okay. would simply need to vote on this article. Okay, thank you. The question is, shall uh, Article 13 be adopted? Are you ready for that question? Yes. Susanna Guthman, Morrisville residence. In light of the opioid crisis, the high rate of suicide here in Lamoille County, the cost of addiction to many of the families here, many of the people here. I note that we are appropriating $3,900 to Lamoille County Mental Health. Next year, I would like to see a larger amount there. I don't know if this is the proper forum, but I do think that is too low for us because I think more individuals need mental health care to counteract what's happening in Lamoille County. They're just too many, too many deaths. It's, it's, a, it's just a crisis for all of us. Thank you. The question is, shall Article 13 be adopted? Are you ready for that question? If so, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Suppose nay. The ayes appear to have it. The ayes do have it. And you've adopted Article 13. Article 14 is, shall the town of Morristown vote to raise, appropriate, and expend the sum of $1,000 for the support of Lamoille County Habitat for Humanity to provide services to the residents of the town? Is there a motion? So moved. Is there a second? Second. The uh, Article 14 has been moved and seconded. Is there any discussion? Dave? Yes, uh, another one of my roles is to serve on the Habitat for Humanity Board of Directors. Uh, we have undertaken our second uh, build fundraising for our second home. It's slated to be uh, constructed on Maple Street here in Morrisville. We feel that issues of affordable housing are key to the economic development and the social and emotional well-being of our citizens. We ask that the Morristown voters support our efforts with a, uh, an allocation of $1,000. Is there any further discussion on Article 14? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed, nay. The ayes appear to have it, the ayes do have it, and you've adopted Article 14. Article 15, shall the town of Morristown vote to raise, appropriate, and expend the sum of $15,000 for the support of everyone equals Morristown Community uh, Center to provide services to the residents of the town? Is there a motion to adopt Article 15? Is there a second? Is there any discussion? Good morning, everybody. I'm Billy Dunham I'm from Morrisville. I'll take the shorter one. I'm Sunny Brink from Morrisville. Um, and we're here representing um, uh, E equals MC squared is what we um, tend to call it, which is everyone equals Morristown's community center. Um, and we just kind of wanted to let everybody know the services that we currently have and some of the program that we're currently working on. So we serve um, our LGBTQ communities um, with partnerships with Outright Vermont. Um, we do the FNG um, on the first and third uh, Fridays. We do um, a fatherhood support group that meets every Tuesday. Um, we do um, B, which is a transgender and non-binary um, support group on Mondays, which is the second and fourth Monday of the month, and then we do ping, ping is it ping pong or table tennis? Table tennis, <laughs> table tennis. It's open to the 20, is it 25 plus? 25 plus, yeah. And, uh, who is this? Harold. 
Cross and John Duffy facilitate that, and um, we have more programming as our building is um, nearing completion that we'll be offering, um, and we have supported over a thousand um, Morrisville residents so far in the three months that we've been open. So we appreciate the um, support from our community. And also, aside from uh, the youth center that we currently have um, in town, which is amazing, we love that uh, we have the. We also uh, currently. Uh, provide services for the youth in the community as well. I think with a combination of the youth center and the combination of what we're doing as well, we're gathering many, more, many, many more youth in our community, providing them uh, after school programming. Our after school program is also open from 2.45 uh, until 5.30. And so we're seeing a lot of kids kind of coming back and forth with, it, with all the different programming. Um, so we're, the last week we had, before break, there's 84 kids that came through uh, the doors, uh, 30 kids on the last day, which is it's continuing to grow and grow, which is amazing. So I think that the combination of everything is uh, really helpful to our community, for sure. Is there further discussion? <laughs> Seeing none, all those in favor of adopting Article 15, please say aye. Aye. Let's oppose nay. Nay. The ayes appear to have it. The ayes do have it, and you have adopted Article 15. Article 6. Uh, so we have now concluded all of the warned municipal articles. Um, Article 16 is there, is there any other business that may legally come before the 2019 annual town meeting in connection with the foregoing municipal articles? Marsha? Marsha Marble, Morristown. Uh, we've given, just given money to the noise home repair, the museum. There is no, I have not found any article about the museum in our town report. And it would have been quite helpful to have that especially going forward to know where our money has gone. Would anybody from the select board like to speak to that? Or Rick? Thank you, and I'll, well, I will make sure that there's something next year in the town report for you. Mary Ann? I, um, for 26 years as town clerk, was uh, happy to enlighten people on the difference between Morristown and Morrisville. <laughs> if, if you have not, it, when you go to vote your Australian ballot, there's a non-binding referendum that asks you to decide if you want to, hit, to be the town of Morristown or the town of Morrisville. A little history is that in 1780, a spunky group, some of you know what spunky means, uh, of the Green Mountain Republic presented a petition to the General Assembly to erect a township in the name of Morris Town. So for 250 years, we've been the town of Morris Town. Now, how did we get to be the village? The village is an incorporated, is, is a corporation within the town. It has its own charters, its own officers, and it is a village entity. We all live in the town of Morristown. Some of you are lucky enough to live in the village of Morrisville. I think it might be confusing if you don't know the history, there's a book called Morristown Two Times that, that will enlighten you. There's a history to maintain. If you vote this non-binding referendum, I would ask you to vote that we remain the town of Morristown. I'm with Marianne 100%. Out of at least deference to these people that came up here and chopped their farms out of a dense forest and wanted to have it called Morristown, 
I, I, and for 240 years, it's worked out okay. And for the people who are confused, the word town appears at the end of Morris, and ville appears at the end of Morrisville. It, it doesn't seem to me, uh, maybe they want to know where the boundaries are. There are maps that show that. But I don't think it's any great uh, uh, thing. What? Oh, yeah, the post office is the one that made this mess for us, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Well, let's keep Morris down. Monty. Monty Mason. Just uh, wanted to find out if anybody done any uh, calculation on if we're going to have to change signs coming into town, a you know, financial type of uh, obligation to change in the name. Apparently, no. <laughs> well, I, I, I bet there are some things that would have to be done. I bet maybe our charter would have to be changed, the town's charter, uh, the village charter. Maybe the spunky residents of Morristown should petition either the legislature or the Congress to make the post office change our name. <laughs> Kate Greenman from Morrisville. Can anybody speak to any possible savings from changing it from Morrisville to Mo from Morristown to Morrisville? Does it eliminate um, salaried employees in some way in the legislature? I mean, in the government of, of the two entities? None that we're aware of. Are there any other, is there any other business? Seeing none, there being no further business to come before the annual meeting of town of Morristown, I would entertain a motion to adjourn. The motion to adjourn has been moved and seconded. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. I suppose nay. Just remind everybody that uh, don't forget to go to the municipal building to vote for the town and school district Australian ballot articles.